Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. I am your host, Justin Dixon. And today on the podcast, we've got Matt Druin. Uh, Matt lives up in Rochester, New York, uh, which is actually where he primarily focuses a lot of his real estate investing focus. Uh, Matt started his journey kind of uh, forced into it, if you will. Um, his dad said he had a, to the end of the year to to get out of the house and, and find his own place to live. So he decided to, instead of renting a place, he decided to buy a, a four- uh, unit apartment complex uh, so he could live rent free. So uh, we talk about his journey from being a bank teller to a real estate investor uh, and a realtor acquiring his first 76 units, um, getting to financial freedom by the age of 33, uh, and then transitioning from the smaller two to six unit apartment complexes into office storage, uh, offices storage, and, and larger multis. Uh, very interesting episode with Matt. Uh, so let's get Matt on the pod. Do you love your job, but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks? If so, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. Matt, man, hey, welcome to the podcast. Happy to have you on. Oh, thanks for having me, Justin. It is an honor. Yeah, no, I appreciate the time. So let's just kind of jump right in. Maybe give a quick overview of who you are, where you are, and uh, and then we can kind of unpack some stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I uh, had been a real estate professional for 17 years, uh, but I got into the business by accident. Um, I started in 2006. I went to a state school, a SUNY school, Geneseo, and um, I thought that I was going to be like a you know stock trading analyst, okay. uh, Gordon Gecko type of cigar chomping, uh, rap- rapacious capitalist, and that sort of thing. <laughs> and um, I graduated in two thousand six. You know, I was a you know a B student with a liberal arts degree uh, from a state school, and I thought I was going to conquer the world. And in two thousand six, I don't know if. Uh, so your listeners have been through that, but if you were looking for a job in 2006 when you had a liberal or art, liberal arts degree with no experience, it was a tough go. Uh, we were yeah. at the peak of the economy. Um, I would had interview after interview after interview. I had so many applications I put out there with no responses. And so finally, the best job I could find was as a part-time bank teller at Chase Bank in my old uh, hometown. Uh, it was a suburb of Rochester, New York. And um, I hated the job. It was it just absolutely sucked. Um, you know, to put on top of it being standing in one place all day. Uh, I also had, you know, my colleagues from school. I I was a uh, lived in a sort of a affluent um, suburb. My family moved out of the city of Rochester to put us in a better school district. They used every single penny they had to buy their house there. So we were house poor. We lived on sort of the working class area of the area. So I had this sort of inferiority complex. And I was graduating from a state school and my, you know, friends with fancy degrees from like Northwestern and Yale yeah. were coming in and depositing their first paychecks from their jobs. And I was just like, <laughs> well, that's going to be aw- awkward and awful at the same time where you're like, you know how much you're making. And they're like, here, can you put this in my bank account? And you're just seeing that grow and grow and grow. <laughs> <laughs> So yeah, so it was a, it kind of it kind of sucked on all fronts, right? So um, I remember complaining about this job to my dad all the time. He was uh, went full time as real as a real tour, mm-hmm. and um, you know he didn't start off that way. He was a general laborer for Genesee Brewery, and he was like, "Listen, Matt, if you want to get your real estate license, I will. You know, I'll show you the ropes. I'm not going to give you any deals. I'm not going to feed you any business. You're going to have to go out and grow your own book of business. Anything." as an alternative to what I was doing was, was I was willing to do it. I was willing to eat. I was willing to eat a poop sandwich um, as an alternative to working for Chase Bank. Um, So, so I took the opportunity and went in it. It was a, it was definitely a rough go trying to build a business as a realtor. Uh, I looked young, I was inexperienced. um, And, uh, but I made a go of it. And I saved up about $16,000 in rent check. I mean, not in rent checks and commission checks. Mm. And my dad uh, gave me the boot out of the house. He was like, you got till the end of the year to move out of the house. Um, so you can either get an apartment with your friends or buy a multifamily house and live in one of the units and rent out the rest. And I, uh, liked the idea of not paying rent because I wasn't paying rent to my good old dad. Uh, so landlords. Yeah. (laughs) 
So when I closed on that property, um, the really major aha moment was I closed in the middle of the month, two weeks went by and I magically had $1,800 in rent checks sitting in my mailbox. All right. Yeah. Now, if you knew what type of real estate I sold at that point in time, I mean, I was selling, you know, that we had these ABC streets in, in the city of Rochester, you know, Avenue A, Avenue B. You know, th- this is not the newer alphabet city. I mean, this was, you know, tough properties, $40,000 deals. Um, it took me a lot of work to earn $1,800 in commission checks. Right. Um, so I was like, damn, this is almost like criminal. Two weeks went by, I earned $1,800. And it, you know, I had like, you know, there's work involved with it, but it's passive-ish income. So that's really what where I got bit by the bug. And I just started scaling from there and uh, utilizing techniques that um, I didn't really even know existed. I was just kind of like, you know, hammerheading my way through the whole thing. And, um, you know, fast forward, I acquired up to 76 doors um, over a 13-year period, a smaller multifamily. And uh, I was able to claim my financial freedom or financial independence at the age of 33. I'm 39 now. Um, my major painful process of reinventing myself came when I woke up in the morning and I didn't have to set an alarm clock. And my wife, my number one partner was at work. She was a teacher. And that dream of backpacking through Italy for two months, uh, I wasn't going to do it on my own. Yeah. Um, so I was like, all right, well, I knew I wanted to do big deals from the get go. And so now is my time. So um, my second sort of aha moment was when I um, came across a million dollar uh, commercial deal. Um, I didn't have the money to take it down. Uh, but I knew that this was the ticket to kind of launching myself into the big league, so to speak. I had so many limiting beliefs and you know glass ceilings uh, above my head. And uh, I took that one deal down and um, I had to raise $300,000 in capital. It was my first time raising capital. And that one deal alone, when I refinanced it and implemented the value add strategy, replaced my wife's income with that one deal. Wow. And I never looked back. So here I am today. That's awesome. So there's a lot to unpack there. And I guess the you kind of benefited, uh, I guess, from kind of living in a tough love house because you weren't in a situation where you could just kind of rest easily, right? I think... um, you know, some people, they, they grow up and, you know, they get taken care of or they find a cushy job and all that fun stuff. And it's easy. Your life, you know, sounds like it wasn't bad in the sense that like, it was, you know, you grew up in a really poor area or whatever, but like you, you had like parents that were like, no, no, you got to figure this out. Like, we're not going to handhold you through this whole process. Like your dad's saying, he's not going to give you any deals or share any of that stuff. That's, that's pretty awesome. So I guess, uh, how did the, from a mindset perspective, because I think mindset's like a very important thing. Like my mindset shifted, you know, five years ago when we started, you know, re- re- investing in real estate and, and kind of reading books and, and kind of just thinking like, oh, wow, there's actually something else out there other than the stock market and a 401k and, and all that fun stuff. But mm-hmm. like, how did your mindset kind of shift or, or was it always kind of in this like entrepreneurial spirited, like I'm going to figure my own thing out. It sounds like you kind of were like, I'm going to go the stockbroker route and and be the Gordon Gecko, which is, you know, starting out as a, you know, as a W2 employee and kind of working your way up. But mm-hmm. like, how did that shift your mindset of like, no, I got to figure this out and and then just do it. Having my back against the wall uh, was, uh, it has always been where I've been in the best position of strength. Mm. Um, so, and that's just me personally. P- some people don't feel like, like don't want to have their back up against the wall. But when you have to do something because your life depends upon it, now I'm not talking about life or death here, but when the stakes are when the stakes are high and the pressure is high, uh, and you have all of these things that are uncomfortable, uh, is kind of where my major moments of growth have been. So yeah. um, this whole thing, I'm a completely different individual right now than I was when I was when I was a kid. I was I was a quiet daydreamer. I was very timid, and I didn't want to take risks on anything because risks to me were scary. Yeah. Um, so through going through all of those processes of basically getting, po- you know, um, you know, Tony Robbins talks about, you know, getting, getting pulled through instead of trying to push through. Um, that's kind of how I've been able to, to grow. Cause you know, everybody knows like if there's a car driving down the street, that's got a rope on the end of it and you grab a hold of that rope, that car is going to drag you with it, but try yeah. getting a car going from a dead stop. It's just a different type of, um, animus to the whole thing. So I think that's kind of what I attribute that mindset shift and shifts to, cause it continues to shift. Yeah. Cause that's, that's the beauty of like the real estate game is like, once you learn one thing, you realize like, Oh wow, there's like a bunch of other things. And like, it's hard to, I've experienced myself where it's like, it's hard to focus on 
one thing where it's like, cause you hear about other people doing amazing things in Airbnb or these, all these other cool parts of, of real estate. So I'm curious to learn a little bit more about that first, you know, multifamily deal. Obviously, you know, you had to figure it out, but how big was it? Like, what was the, you know, how did you, did you have tenants already? Like, how did you find them? I'm very curious kind of about that, like, you know, house hacking strategy. You probably did it before the word was even invented. Um, but it's a very popular strategy, especially amongst like early, um, investors or, or younger folks. Cause they have maybe the, the interest in, in living in a, you know, small multi and having roommates, uh, or, or people, you know, living in apartments right next to you. Um, so let's talk about that first and then we'll dig into some of the stuff you're doing, you know, more recently. Yeah. So it wasn't too scary for me because I mean, all four units were occupied. There was a, a tenant that's lease was rolling off uh, in the springtime, summertime, something like that. I don't remember. But the reason why I chose that unit is because it had access to the attic, right? Mm. This was four one bedroom apartments. I wanted to not pay anything, not mortgage, taxes, insurance, repairs, maintenance. I want to have everything covered. Yeah. So I was like, okay, well, I'll move up to the attic, which this attic was it was not very comfortable. I mean, I had to run the air conditioning probably 80% of the <laughs> of the year, right. but I got a room, I got a roommate, um, with a, uh, with a situation and I painted up the attic. It was the old servants quarters in the house. And, um, and so it was pretty, it was, it was a stable, I'd say, call it a stabilized value add deal. Um, okay. So you don't have so, to do a lot of like work to the other units. They were already occupied and they were like, you know, for all intent and purposes, ready to go. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I and I had no idea about like, oh, the rents were below market and that sort of thing. All I was looking at was what the current rents were on the property. Yeah. I was like, okay, I just did basic, like sort of just rudimentary math. And I was like, okay, I can make this work and it works to fit my goals. Um, you know, fast forward, I still own I still own that property to this day. Um, but you know, the rents were six fifty a month um yeah. on those one bedrooms. And I did some improvements, like light cosmetic improvements over the years, but now those apartments are renting for about a thousand dollars a month. Um, but uh, but I mean, I I learned how to do that in terms of increasing value through watching other people uh do it and utilizing, you know, increasing the value, you refinance it, you pull some cash out, use it for your next deal. Yeah. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about some of the next strategies. And I'm curious kind of about going from that first deal to the next one, because obviously, you know, you were a bank teller, right? So they weren't making a ton of money and probably still don't at this point. But mm -hmm. before we dig into this next deal, I want to kind of take a quick sponsor break. So we will be right back. Whether you're in a job you love or hate, building a financial foundation is important. This foundation can support you by providing passive income, stability in an uncertain economy, or the launching pad for you to start your own business. Great Venture Capital helps busy professionals invest in commercial real estate to build passive income streams, grow wealth, and take advantage of tax benefits. If you'd like to learn more, check us out at greatventurecapital.com or send an email to justin at greatventurecapital.com. All right. We are back on the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast with Matt. Before the break, we kind of talked a little bit about kind of your your entry into the real estate world, kind of being kicked into it, uh, essentially. Um, and then kind of the first deal that you took down is that kind of house hacking deal. So how did you go from that first one? And then you were obviously, it sounds like you were a realtor at that point. So commission only, I'm guessing. So you had to be selling deals uh, in your real estate game to then fund your investments. So kind of walk us through kind of the next few years of evolution and, and you know, getting up to that 76, I think you said 76 units, um, you know, to kind of hit that, that that financial freedom. So let's, let's kind of walk through some of that stuff. Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, the big problem people have with growth is they buy their first investment property and they blow out all their cash. Yep. Um, and I was, you know, that $16,000 I put down in this owner occupied four family was everything I had. Um, and I knew, but I knew I wanted to grow. So, um, the next deal was actually a few doors down from it. It was the probably the worst house on the street. It was another four family. And um, yeah, my dad kept pestering me every time he came over for beer and pizza to hang out with me. Um, he was like, did you call on that property yet? It looks like they're going to need to sell that thing pretty soon. Cause it's like the roof is shot. There's mm. trees over the trees look like they're going to crush the house pretty soon. There's like broken down cars in the, you know, behind, <laughs> behind the house. <laughs> so basically I was like, you know, it wasn't out of, my dad encouraged me, right? Yeah. Um, he pestered me. 
And so that nagging of like, okay, I don't want my dad to ask me this question anymore. So I just made it a point to get in touch with the owner. Um, fast forward, I got the property under contract for 80,000 um, bucks. The, the first one I bought was $165,000. Okay. So I bought this one for $80,000. And this was in a great neighborhood, by the way. Um, you could not get financing in this property. The roof was shot. I mean, everything, the, the porch was falling apart. So I got under contract and I was like, dad, I, I, I did what you said, like offer him $80,000 cash uh, and close in four weeks. What do I do now? I don't have $80,000 right. in cash. I don't know who, who has the money. <laughs> yeah. So um, the mortgage company that we had a relationship with that we referred a lot of our clients to uh, unbeknownst to me um, did hard money lending. Uh, mm. The principal of the company, um, Phil Nothnagel, uh, you know, basically I presented the deal with them, my numbers, and you know, I'd kind of be like, oh, this is what's gonna be worth afterwards. And I can take it to a bank and take your loan out in less than 12 months. Right. So I got the acquisition financed, the eighty thousand dollars plus sixty thousand dollars worth of um, worth of repairs. And also the payments on the mortgage were deferred for 12 months. Oh wow. So it bought me a lot of runway to have like a you know some margins of error because I made a ton of mistakes in the process, but but that was my major aha moment. It's like you can grow a real estate empire with none of your own money if you know how to raise capital and put deals together and yeah. creative deals sometimes. And so that was the, you know, that first deal, the four family was that sixteen thousand dollars of my seed fund to start the whole thing. And I haven't put another dime into our deals thus far. So talk more about that because I'm 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 curious. Um, because we my wife and I, we our first deal was a two uh, a duplex and mm -hmm. i was always nervous about single family just because one tenant one uh you know occupancy if that person leaves i'm on the hook for the whole mortgage right so mm -hmm. obviously you had a similar mindset i'm assuming because going into a four unit you could you knew you could cover at least the mortgage assuming you know you had a few tenants in there mm -hmm. um so you buy this next one on you know financing through the mortgage lender uh and what what time period is cuz obviously you started in 06 um, you know, 07, 08, 09 were not great from a you know housing market perspective. So is this in that set time frame? So it was in uh, 2008 is when I closed okay. in this property. Yeah, and it okay. took me a year to turn it turn it around. You know, and I was a 20 something year old kid trying to yeah. work with con trying to work with contractors, trying to be the boss. You know, being the guys on HGTV that manage these flips, yeah. and I got taken advantage of like left left, right, and center. Yeah. Uh, but I managed to get through it. Um, and I learned a lot in the process. Uh, but uh, I was able to, you know, increase the value on that pro property sufficient to where I was able to take it to a community bank and get it refinanced and uh, take the hard money out. And so I was like, okay, well, let's do this at scale. Yeah. Um, so that's what I ended up doing since then. Got it. And so what, where are you getting for the next kind of three, four, five deals? Like where, where's the capital coming from? Cause it sounds like you just said, like, I don't really use any of my own money to fund some of these deals. So are you raising it, uh, from investors or are you like, how, how are you getting that capital? So the first 76 doors was utilizing the Burr strategy and hard money. Okay. All right. So establish relationships with some private money lenders that uh, they weren't as hard as some of the hard money you you see out there. Like uh, you know, between seven and nine percent interest, I was paying them. Uh, sometimes it was interest interest deferred, and the deals were small enough in terms of being sub five hundred thousand that I could find you know private money lenders that were comfortable putting a first lien position mortgage on it. Yeah. Um, the major shift was when you know I went to go after this million dollar deal, and that was. Too, that was just too much. There wasn't a lot of these private money lenders that had that type of uh, dry powder to do right. that. So I was like, okay, well, I've heard of raising capital for like in terms of equity to buy deals. So um, so maybe that's a thing. And that's what I did, did on that deal. And then that's how I've structured all of my deals uh, since then as we've grown. Got it. So the 76 doors that you've purchased, have they all been the Burr method where you're, you're buying them, you're rent renovating, refinancing and, and all that fun stuff. Is that, so you're essentially just kind of taking that initial capital, that, that hard money lender, putting it into a deal, using that to also fix it. You know, obviously you're increasing the value of that property, take it to a, a bank saying, cool, it's worth more. I'm going to pull out all that cash. So you have that cash and maybe a little bit more left over, And then you just kind of rinse and repeat that process. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. And then sin since then, I've just kind of bolted that same strategy on, but on larger commercial deals. So I mean, we're essentially doing... And a lot of other capital raisers that are in the larger multifamily space, I mean, they're essentially doing commercial burring. 
um, you know, they're, they'll buy a 200 unit for 20 million, you know, $20 million and then they'll, you know, fix it up and push the value to $30 million. And, you know, it's really the same concept. It's just at a different order of magnitude. Got it. And so how many of the 76 units, I guess, uh, do you still own all of them or have you kind of sold some off and then, you know, reposition that, that capital? So, um, I've kind of developed a, a barometer for our holdings. So okay. return on equity is basically the barometer. And I want to be consistently achieving about 11% return on equity uh, with all of my holdings. So now all pro- all the properties aren't always going to meet that. But if there's one that's appreciated a lot, where I paid a lot of debt down and the return on equity, the return on equity drops in properties over years. You pay debt down, hopefully the property appreciates and your cash flow doesn't grow commensurate with your equity position. Right. So when properties go below 11% significantly uh, consistently, I make the decision to either refinance it and pull cash out again, uh, or I'll sell the property. So there was a two family as part of that portfolio I just sold recently. The property I owed $130,000 on it. Um, similar properties were trading for about $360,000. Um, that property was cash flowing about $4,000 a year. So I couldn't go and strap more debt on it. And I was like, if I was going to do that, then I might not even meet my debt service coverage ratio covenant with right. my bank. So it was a very clear decision for me to um, to sell that property. Now, how I repositioned that capital was, you know, most people say, oh, I'll do a 1031 exchange. Well, I don't want to do that because I've seen what it's done to clients, especially in a really, really tight market um, that we're in right now, where the bid ask spreads between what sellers are expecting and what buyers need to pay considering current interest rates. I just didn't want to have that gun against my head. So I just basically just just put the cash in my balance sheet. Um, we'll do the taxes for 2023 and see how it shakes out from you know what other net loss carry forwards I can do to wash out that capital gain. Yeah. Um, and then maybe do a cost segregation analysis on one of my larger assets um, to uh, to wash that out even further. And maybe I won't have to pay any capital gains on it. Yeah, I think the the 1031 is is a great like tool to use. Um, but it is a time constrained tool, right? You have to find a deal in a certain amount of time and then place that money. And so there is a ticking time bomb, so to speak, um, where you've got to kind of, you know, put that money somewhere. Uh, and so you don't want to put it in someplace um bad, right? You want to make sure it's a it's a good investment. But yeah, it's uh Unless you have a deal kind of lined up, which you ideally would, um, that way you can just kind of flip it over and, and make it a lot easier. So um, I'm curious about the the deal sizes, right? Because I've, you know, a lot of people that I talk to that, including myself, that started out in smaller multis, two, four, or five, whatever units, they tend to go, you know, they buy a few of the smaller deals, they go maybe to the 20 or 30 units, and then they buy one or two of those. And like, no, 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 they with the ultimate goal of getting to that that syndicator, like that 100 plus unit apartment complex. And it sounds like you've been very successful in this smaller multi space, which um, I think is really fascinating because you're you have built a 76 unit portfolio over a number of deals. So I'm curious about how how many deals are there in that? Are they all two to four unit properties? And then how do you manage it all? Because that's, you know, it's easy managing I say easy. It's relatively easy managing one 76 unit property versus, you know, 10 seven unit properties. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I was, when I was in growth mode, my, my plan was to fire myself from the operations. Um, I had the economies of scale to hire somebody in house to manage that portfolio. Mm. So I, um, I grew to that level. I had a kind of a cobbled together management structure where, you know, I was doing the leasing and I was doing the rent collection. And then I was having like a maintenance company do the maintenance and the turns and all that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, that was the major moment where I was able to actually put gasoline on my fire, um, and start going into the larger deal space was when I was able to bring out a partner to create a management company to manage like my stuff so that I could concentrate 100% of my focus on growing the company, growing our relationship with with our potential investment partners, as well as working on deal on deal flow as well for our business, which are the two bottlenecks to any investor's growth is deal flow and capital. Yeah. And so are you looking at all these deals in, in Rochester area, like in, in that neck of the woods, like you trying to keep it in your backyard? Primarily, yeah. I mean, this is, I have a competitive advantage uh, here. I mean, I know every street, I know every neighborhood, I know all the major player, all the major players um, in the market. And I think that that's like a non replicatable 
unique value proposition is when you have rich understanding of your market. Yeah. Um, so I've definitely leaned on that heavily. Uh, would I be opposed to going outside of our market? Absolutely not. I mean, we're we're sort of a a, a good blend between uh, equity and cash flow in our market. Uh, typically, the deals I'm buying are usually around between a you know eight and eight and a half percent stabilized cap rate. Um, but I mean, sometimes I get like, damn, four percent cap rate markets seem very very attractive to me. Sometimes you know if you can push, you know. A rents in a market that have consistently seven percent rent appreciation uh, over a twenty year period. So you have like a really yeah. really good da- data for a stable market. You're able to buy at a four percent cap rate, and if you increase the NOI a hundred thousand dollars over five years, you create two and a half million dollars worth of value. Right. Um, so I've definitely considered it. I haven't made the jump yet, uh, but I'm not taking it off the table. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, uh, you're you said you're 39, right? So you, uh, I'm sure you're going to be doing this for a little bit longer. Um, so let's talk about that transition to the bigger stuff, right? So I guess before you do that, what was what's the biggest deal you did si- uh, unit size wise in that first 76? Uh, the biggest one in that 76 was a was a six family. Okay, in terms of like one particular property, so it was all small multifamily. Yeah. Yeah, so you're doing a bunch of different deals, right, to get to that 76. Mm-hmm. So when did you make that transition um, to the larger deal? And it sounds like that first one was, you know, a million dollars. So how big was that? And then, you know, let's talk about kind of how you raise that money because it sounds like you've kind of used a different capital raising strategy on the first, uh, you know, handful of deals, and now you're using the kind of traditional, if you will, um, strategy. So let's let's walk through that one. Yeah, so that one was a uh, it's about a sixteen thousand square foot office building. It was uh, all smaller offices, uh, okay. so small businesses. It was one hundred percent occupied at the time that I bought it. Um, it had a really strong rental history. Um, the owner that I bought it from owned it for twenty about twenty years and never like always had it at one hundred percent occupancy. So one of the things that signaled to me is that when something's at one hundred percent occupancy, then your rents are below market, right? Yep. Um, and so, and also I looked at the, um, the expenses on the property. I was familiar with, um, properties that type. It was an old, it was an older property, really, really charming, like brick building with like a slate, like Dutch colonial style roof in the front of the building. Um, but the expenses were really high on the property mm. as well. So I knew I had to push rents, uh, cause they were clearly below market and then also, uh, normalized expenses. Utility bills were high. The management company that had it uh, under management had a part-time like we're talking about 20 hours a week, part-time maintenance person allocated to this property. Oh, geez. Okay. And so I'm like, that's not right. You know, right. so the, you know, that was definitely an expense that I was able to shave off. Um, but uh, I was able, I had a five-year business plan. So I raised the $300,000. At this point in time, this was in 2017. Um, interest rates were still low. Uh, so yeah. I offered out a fixed rate of return of 7%. Uh, distributed monthly to the original investors in this deal, and I was oversubscribed. Um, so fast forward to now, it's a completely different picture when you can get you know five percent on an FDIC insured money market account. <laughs> right. um, but um, but yeah, so I was able to keep one hundred percent of the equity. They were happy with getting the mail bo- mailbox money. Um, I was able to uh, increase the value from a million to one point six million over a two year period. Um, so then I was able to have the equity there to refinance, pay them back to $300,000. And then they were investors, you know, those people, original ones have been investors with me every, uh, ever since on every single one of my deals. Interesting. So instead of offering some type of a like true syndication where you're, you know, there's a pref or, or, and there's, you know, a pref, pref return, and then you've got an equity split and all the fun stuff. You're like, no, 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 no. I'm going to keep all the equity. You just get a fixed rate of return. And then you are able to then essentially buy them out of their position once you are able to refinance and do a cash out, right? Like, so they're not even in the deal anymore. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that uh, it, you know, every deal is different and then every market's different too. I mean, I think that real estate operators have to be familiar with what's going on in the capital markets outside of real estate as well. Yeah. Um, I recognized that uh, the bond market was, you know, paying really, really abysmally low coupon rates uh, or yields uh, on that. I mean, there was just no people were starving for yield. So seven percent was, you know, was better than a sharp stick in the eye. Yeah. Um, which is actually the words that one of my investors 
<laughs> told me when I originally pitched him, uh, pitched him the deal better than a sharp stick in the eye. So, um, so I think that, you know, now fast forwarding, I think that investors considering the, you know, risk-free rate of return, you have to take that into consideration too. Um, yeah. your, the demands of your investors are going to, that's sometimes going to be the tail that wags the dog, unfortunately. Um, and you have to take that in consideration and bake it into your, uh, into your projections on what, on the types of deals you're going to do. Um, so, but, um, but yeah, I mean, we've done straight up just fixed income deals. We've done, you know, um, equity partnerships. We've never done a full blown syndication. I only buy probably one deal a year that's larger. And I like to push the envelope every single, so I'm like, if I can do a million dollar deal, I can do a $2 million deal. Uh, if I can do a $2 million deal, I can do a $4 million deal. Right. Um, so, and I've just been able to keep going back to the same well of investors and expanding that network of of, in, uh, of investment partners. And I've never had to go above the, the 25 investor mark there. So I've been able okay. to kind of keep it as a, as a, you know, more of like a joint, joint venture. Um, they're, yeah. uh, they're some kind of partner that's on the operating, you know, that's on the operating agreement. They have a membership interest. Um, and then the operating agreement is customized to what we, you know, set out to in terms of the offering. Um, so that's kind of how we've done it since then. Got it. So office space is kind of a, an interesting kind of topic, uh, just in general right now, given where we are and we're recording this in mid August, 2023. So, you know, remote hybrid work from home, all that fun stuff, like is, is very kind of top of mind. I don't know what kind of office building that is, if it is true, like office or if there's like medical offices or whatever, but like, are you still investing in office space or are you, is, was that your one and only kind of commercial office real estate? No, I, I own more office, uh, you know, I'm sort of a, I'm sort of a contrarian. Um, I like to, you know, when there's something that comes out there, that's the new hotness, whether it's, you know, STR or MTR or self storage or whatever is, is out there. I kind of like to, you know, look at other things and uh, I've this, but everything is, you know, managing risks. So this particular office building was, you know, it's, a lot of smaller office users. There's about 16 office tenants that are there. So we have users that are anywhere between, you know, a hundred square foot singular office to mm. maybe a 3000 square foot office that has, you know, 15 employees that work out of it. Yeah. So there wasn't this major exposure to these are, you know, mom and pop companies, sometimes solo, you know, solopreneurs. Um, so we're not talking about huge exposures where you have, you know, you know, 20,000 square foot office floor plates, um, that type of stuff I wouldn't touch right now. Yeah. Um, but you know, fast forward, I mean, we just closed on a 50,000 square foot, uh, high rise office building. Um, and uh, it was such a great deal because the entire investment community post COVID redlined office completely out. So we got a fantastic deal on a property that was occupied by government tenants with super long-term leases, uh, and uh, on a building that had no defer, deferred maintenance either. So mm -hmm. we were able to buy this thing at a, at a 9% cap, uh, 9% cap rate. And, um, with, and we bought it based, based upon in place occupancy. So this thing was 90% occupied and we were able to get the 10% for free. So whatever we lease up out of that 10% is goes hundred percent of it goes straight to the net operating income. Right. So this is where you can really explode asset value, um, through that, but doing it in a way that's heating risk in the process. Yeah, that's interesting. I feel like the the bigger, newer office spaces are the ones that have maybe a little bit more risk in the kind of office space environment. Um, I live in Austin and there's buildings being built left and right that are not occupied, right? They're still vacant, which is kind of weird to see. But um, mm -hmm. and so I guess so I guess after that 16,000 square feet deal you bought, so let's that was your kind of first bigger opportunity. So where where, where are you now from like a, a total asset center management? Um, and what's the mix of, of office and, and kind of residential slash multifamily? So um, in terms of asset center management, uh, we're about $15 million in asset center management. Um, the about $2 million a year in, gro in gross rents. So we're not huge. I mean, we're a pretty small operator in the grand scheme of things, especially if you you know compare us to operators in Austin, Texas, for instance. Um, but um but I think that in terms of our alloc our asset allocation, real estate wise, we're probably about uh, seventy to eighty percent residential, and the rest of it is some type of commercial use. So whether it's retail, okay. office, industrial, um, those types of things. So um, I've actually liked the more of the commercial use space. I feel like we have more of a partnership 
with our tenants. Yeah. Um, we, the residential we own is typically in higher income areas and these tenants, they basically, they use us for a couple of years and then they buy a house. Um, right, right. You're a stepping so, stone. But, uh, you know, nothing really gave me a greater thrill than like buying a mixed use building that has the residential income coming on it and being able to like, you know, change the complexion of a corner along a major Mm. corridor by reprogramming the retail space. Um, So that's where I kind of like, there's a lot of creativity that goes into the commercial space there. But, you know, there's different moving parts involved with it. And I think that if you're interested in doing the commercial route, not just multifamily, consider buying a mixed use building. Um, because you kind of are hedging your risks that way. Yeah. And what are the, I, I mean, I've always been curious about the mixed use space because it kind of gives you the best of both worlds, assuming that you can occupy all the facets of the of the deal. But mm-hmm. like, how does it work from more of a unit mix and a funding and all that stuff? Because obviously part of it is multifamily, part of it is commercial. Like there's some differences there. I'm just kind of curious and we don't need to get too deep in the weeds, uh, but it's kind of curious how you how you kind of underwrite that from like, You've got multifamily, you've got commercial tenants and and all that. Um, so I have, uh, I mean, uh, the underwriting part is uh, if you, it's very difficult if you have vacant commercial space because okay. it's like um, typically most of the mixed use that I've bought, there's been, you know, we've had occupancy of the commercial spaces. Maybe they've been below below market rent. A uh, great resource to finding: Hey, is it below market rent? Is you know asking a broker. Yeah, um, yeah. What's trading for in this uh, in this area, and where it's actually moving? Not what they're asking for, but where where are these deals actually moving? Yeah. Um, myself, I mean, I have a subscription to CoStar, um, so I'm able to pull a lot of data out of there. But I still ask brokers because with any data system, it's like it's garbage in, garbage out. Um, yeah, it's always lagging, right? You're always getting like like historicals. It's not like future looking or like where's it going. It's yeah, yeah. Uh, and then on the mixed use side of things, I mean, a lot of people and developers make the mistake of thinking like, I have prime storefront commercial space. I need to extract as much out of that as possible because this is pure gold. Um, I think that's kind of a, the wrong approach to it. I think that. You can add a lot more value to the residential, which is usually a bigger component of the whole stacking plan than like by programming just rocking commercial, like commercial tenants that are going to bring street level vitality to a neighborhood. Right. And, you know, that rent may not be where you want it to be in, in terms of renting it to a national tenant, uh, but you're going to be able to get a lot more value out of the, um, out of the rest of the deal. Uh, by doing that. So for instance, one deal we did, it was a, I put a, uh, there was a uh, nail salon that was in one of the spaces. It's a creepy nail salon. I think they, you know, did human trafficking through there and stuff like that. I booted them out <laughs> yeah. and I put in a crump, a crumpet shop. Um, you know, cr- like a crumpet is like a, it's basically, I can't even explain it. Just Google it. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> to your listeners, tea, oh, it's it's ing- tea and crumpets, right? It's like a yeah, little like a cake thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, super unique concept um, for the uh, for the area to kind of bring that hipster, you know, the hipster vibe in there. You know, something yeah. as obscure as a crumpet, right? Um, right. And then I put in a uh, a vintage clothing shop. I booted out Rena Center, um, which was in one of the spaces. I I got in a, a vintage clothing. Um, kind of haberdashery type of place. And um, the girl that operates this business has a lot of community events there. She does bicycle socials. Um, she cl- she keeps the place out uh, out front pristine and looking great, um, which our residential tenants appreciate a lot. Yeah, you obviously that's the the curb appeal, right? If you have cool like tenants in your commercial space that are taking care of the property and you know have um, you know appreciation of their own space, then the people above them and the tenants that are walking, you know, to their residential stuff are going to appreciate that space even more. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's interesting. I'm curious about the, where you think we are in, you know, the economic cycle, right. In the sense that, you know, you're, you're exposed to Rochester and that's where you focus your, your kind of investing focus. um, Mm -hmm. But you're spread across a few different asset classes, which is makes sense. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, so again, we're, this is mid August, 2023 interest rates are still high. Are they going to keep raising, you know, what, wh- where do you think? And, and are you still a buyer in this market? Like, are you still actively looking for deals? Yeah, I'm still actively lo- looking for deals. I mean, I just, uh, I just got back from my desk underwriting a 300 unit, uh, plus multifamily deal. Um, so we're still out there. We're still making offers. 
it's just the the major component that you have to take into consideration is your annual debt service. It's different. Yeah. Uh, and that really doesn't change things. It just changes what you uh, can pay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. For a place. Uh, or if you're like, oh, okay, well, if you want that number, then are you willing to hold some paper at a lower rate of 4% at 4%? All right. Um, so we've been making offers like that. Um, I think that you have to maintain being active in a space. If you kind of go into a cave someplace and then come out two years later, you've missed so much. You've missed so much relationship building in the process that you're going to be miles behind um, yeah. your peers. So I think it's important to always be active in your space. Um, and in terms of projections or predictions, you know, I mean, I think that uh, the you know the Fed is you know inflation numbers are definitely you know showing that the Fed's probably going to you know kind of pulling back on rate increases. Um, and I think what's going to end up happening is rates are going to start to go down as inflation goes down. Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of places, you know, uh, especially companies are going to have to be working off inventory. I think that the recession we're going to see is not going to be kind of ubiquitous across the um, entire demographic spectrum. I think that we're going to have yeah. a white collar recession um, because a lot of the layoffs and stress you see in the economy are, are tech related um, and that type of thing. Um, so it's gonna be interesting to see. I think that um, I think in the commercial space, there's definitely gonna be deals. Residential, if you're a small single through four family, once interest rates drop considerably, all those buyers who are standing on the sideline are gonna rush back into the market. All right. Yeah. All right, I can afford to pay more. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so you're going to see those buyers rush back in because people don't really talk about it, but you know, every decrease in uh, interest in terms of points uh, increases a buyer's affordability by 10%. Yeah. Um, so that can be definitely a factor, but I think that the commercial space there, I think there's a lot of people that are just exhausted, you know, have been exhausted. Um, there's a lot of people that are overpaid for stuff. So I think there's going to be some really great opportunities for us to expand in the contraction. Yeah, I think there's um, a lot. There's some pain in the commercial space right now in the multifamily, uh, which is the area that I know uh, best or am most kind of involved in. Because mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the multifamily value add is is variable rate debt, right? And if you bought it two years ago, uh, you probably weren't anticipating. Nobody was anticipating rates going where they where they are and as fast as they got there. So you know you're holding on to an asset that you may have overpaid for, you may be un undercapitalized, and now your debt service has gone up by fifty percent. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, there, there's some interesting times ahead. Um, I think, you know, being a good operator and I'm curious, uh, I know we've been talking for a while, so we'll, we'll wrap here in a second, but, uh, I'm curious about kind of the, uh, the asset management side, because if you bought a deal in 2019, 2020, 2021, and you sold it in 20, early 2022 or something, you could, you know, make a lot of money without really being good at, at your job. Uh, you know, the the economy and and interest rates and and the cap rates compressing and all that fun stuff kind of papered over to the cracks of a lot of bad deals or bad mm -hmm. operators, I guess. But like what what is your area of focus, I guess, from like a pure asset management perspective? Because, you know, that is where the rubber meets the road on these deals now, especially when it's, you know, you, we are in a, an uncertain environment. So you've, you're, you've got exposure across, you know, small multis, larger multis, office, mixed use. So how are you managing the, the assets, um, to make sure that you're getting the returns that you need for yourself? And, and obviously you've got some investors now and, and all of that. Yeah. So the asset management, um, you know, I spend about an hour on that each week. So I meet with, uh, uh, my partner who runs the management company and we talk about kind of high level operations and areas where he needs, you know, he needs support or input. Um, and I think that like the core value is retention, 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 yeah. um, bad retention equals property makes no money. Um, so retention is driven by, uh, service. So want to make sure that maintenance is on point. Um, that uh, we're proactively addressing things that our residents are happy when they put a service request into our system that's responded responded to within 48 hours um and uh, you know that's what and i you know i do look at the numbers every month in terms of the income you know income expense statements and true it up against what the budget looks like um and uh, so you know i think that asset management yeah as you said nobody talks about it but it's the most important thing because if you don't have a good you know good operation, then you're, I don't care what your projections are. You're not going to meet them.
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you can, all these deals are run by spreadsheets, right? So you can make any deal look amazing by changing a few numbers, but the rubber meets road when you actually get that thing under contract and you take over the property and it's like, okay, now we've got to operate this thing. Um, so we'll kind of transition here to the end. Um, I'm curious kind of, you know, for the listeners that maybe they're, they're just kind of dipping their toes in the water of, of real estate investing, whether they want to be active like you are, or they want to be more passive and they have a really good job or whatever, and they make money, but they just want to have access to other investment options. Like what do you think is some good tips to kind of get people, you know, moving down the right path? Obviously they're listening to a podcast about real estate investing. So they're, they're already kind of, you know, starting that process, but like, how do you think it's, it's a, a good next step to kind of get themselves educated and, and learn more about the the space before they, you know, go ahead and, and invest uh, passively or, or jump in, you know, with both feet actively? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a good educational process. I mean, I think that, um, you know, podcasts can only go so far, right? Um, I really think you need to get out there consistently and get belly to belly with people that are active in the space, period. Um, that's what helps you raise your thermostat and raise the bar for yourself. Um, so many investors do like 99% of them that think they want to do it, never end up, never end up doing it. And there are people that I see they've been seeing consistently at a cocktail party every 15 years that are always telling me that I, you know, really have to get into it. Yeah. Um, so you know, surrounding yourself with those people that are active in it, you know, definitely build your confidence level. Um, and then figuring out, you know, it's like, I mean, I'm gonna be honest with you, like there's people out there that are active, um, can help you educate yourself, but also full real estate operators are always broke. Okay. Um, and I'm so jealous of our investors because like they didn't put any of the work in to find the deals. They didn't right. put any of the work in to manage, you know, to manage the business plan, the deals to figure out, you know, to raise the capital, put the, put the debt in place and all the stuff that goes into it. And all they do is they just get a K one at uh, the beginning of the year and they get their distribution checks. Um, I'm jealous of that. That's the, that's the level I want to be at some point in time. So, you know, don't be afraid to be open to the idea of also passively investing in something because I know that a lot of people with podcasts, if that's how they got started in doing the uh, kind of leapfrogging into the larger deal space is through being yeah. a limited partner on a deal. Um, so I think that's kind of like the next, you know, the next step there is just surrounding yourself with, with people that are actively doing it. And then that's going to help raise the bar for you. Yeah, I, I think it's super important to, uh, you know, I'm obviously passive invest in deals. I, I, the first two large multifamily deals that we invested in were passive um, mm -hmm. because we, one, we wanted to learn the space. And two, you know, we we actually learned about this whole self-directed IRA thing that you can like <laughs> pump into and use that, um, which is super interesting. So um, awesome. Well, well, Matt, it's been uh, a lot of fun. Let's kind of transition to the, the final three questions that I ask every guest. And I'm very curious about um, the last one because you already mentioned uh, a little bit about it earlier. Um, and I didn't want to dig into it, but we may hear in the next, uh, this last section. So, um, all right. First question is what is one piece of advice that got you started or helped you along your real estate investing journey? Help me start. I, I did it by accident. So <laughs> I wasn't, uh, really, con uh, really, uh, you know, convinced to do it. It was just like, I needed a place to live. Um, so I think that, you know, don't be afraid to, you know, I think that if you're comfortable and consistently comfortable, you should be uncomfortable. And go out into that. If you're going into the zone of discomfort, then you're growing. So do that. Yeah. I like it. Uh, what is your favorite uh, real estate or business book that you're into right now? Um, I'd say Extreme Ownership by Jocko Link Willink. Um, you know, I'm a leader, not only in my company, but also in, uh, the local RIA that I run the real estate investors association. And, uh, I think that, uh, leadership and sales are two of the most important and elusive skills that are out there. So, um, that was definitely a, a heavily impactful book on my life. Awesome. I haven't heard that one, so I will have to check that out. Um, all right. So last question is if you hit your financial freedom number, which it sounds like you may have already, um, uh, meaning you could live an amazing life just off of the passive income from your, uh, real estate investing, what would you do? Um, yeah, I think that, uh, I mean, I, I'm really, I'm, I'm really there. Um, so, uh, but I think that, you know, also there's these things that growing up with an inferiority complex, um, growing up where I was, I think that, you know, kids and your family just want you to be present. That's it. Um, you know, we took our daughter to Disney World two times this year, and she never got more joy than 
we were walking in the, down the street in our neighborhood and we got ice cream and she found a hopscotch, you know, place and she started hopping around and like, you know, we don't, we don't really need that much. We like to challenge ourselves in terms of living up to some sort of expectation that's really right. not built for us. Um, so I just think that my goal is just to be continually present as a husband and, and a father. Awesome. No, I, I like it. I like it a lot. So Matt, um, how can people find you, hear you, uh, reach out if they're interested in learning more about the Rochester market? Maybe uh, people are, are like, hey, that could be a good investing spot. And obviously you've got a, uh, you know, a, a, got a, a lot of inroads in that area. So how can people reach out to you and find you? Yeah, I'm, on, I'm all, all the social platforms, uh, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, uh, even TikTok. So um, I'm most active on Facebook though. Um, I just find uh, like how the, you know, groups work in Facebook. So mm -hmm. definitely reach out to me if you're looking, you know, wanting to learn more about Rochester or just real estate investing in, in, uh, in general. And, um, I can get you know, connected with, connected with a Facebook group or whatever. Um, I also run the go big live real estate investors podcast, um, where I interview guests just like you, just like you, Justin, on how you did your first big deal and really break it down into the granular level. Um, so if you're looking at, if you're a details person and want to know exactly how they did that, um, then that's definitely a good listen uh, as well. If you want to learn about uh, how to scale. Awesome. No, highly recommend checking that podcast out for sure. Uh, Matt, really appreciate the time. It's been great to learn more about your story and everything. And uh, yeah, we'll really appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, man. I appreciate it too. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please leave a written review. I read every review as it helps me serve you better. If you're listening to this podcast, it means that you want to grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.